Good evening, everyone. It is a great pleasure to uh, do this webinar this uh, evening. I work with uh, Jean-David Vertel and uh, Omar Naji. They are very good experts uh, regarding the reverse prosthesis. So thank you uh, for Jean-David to talk about the biomechanical aspect of the reverse prosthesis. Omar has a very nice experience regarding the e-ortho. This is a software that we use when you do a preoperative planning of reverse autoplasty, and he will show us uh, how does it do. I will tell you about the practice uh, on the video of the surgery, on the result of e -ortho, on some consideration uh, with uh, the positioning of the prosthesis depends of soft tissue on the bone block. I would like to thank the FH Orthopedics. Thank you for all the attendees because you are now 130. And it's a very great pleasure to, uh, to expose uh, our practice on our conception of reverse autoplasty. And now, Jean-David, thank you to, to talk about that biomechanical aspect. And after you see that tips and tricks and application. Thank you to stay one hour. We stay in the good time. And I think that it's a good opportunity to to ask many questions and uh, with Jean-David and Omar, we try to answer to your questions. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, good evening, everyone. So we're going to start with very basic concepts of uh, biomechanics around the shoulder and around the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And so to understand these concepts, it's very important to have uh, uh, some um, very easy, uh, basic uh, notions. And first, the difference between translation and rotation. This is, of course, uh, very easy to understand. Center of rotation, the force couple, the difference between a constrained and an unconstrained joint, and the notion of moment arm that we keep talking about and that we don't really define clearly uh, often. And so what is the difference between translation and rotation? Translation, if you have a solid like that a square, every point of that solid is going to move in the same direction and to the same extent. And so, of course, you're going to have translation to the right of uh, that square. Now, if you look at rotation, if you take the same square, then all the points of that solid, but one, are going to move in a parallel around a curved path that is centered on that fixed point. And so the points are going to move in the same direction, but to different extents, depending on the radial distance from that fixed point. And this has to have two underlined forces that are acting in opposing directions. And this is what the force couple is. And so if you have one force here and another force here, they are not aligned. They act in opposing directions. So they create a force couple. And so you're going to have rotation of uh, that uh, square around the fixed point that is the center of rotation. Now, if we want to look at the difference between constrained and unconstrained joint, it's quite easy to understand. An unconstrained joint is incongruent, while a constrained joint is congruent. So here you have an example of an unconstrained joint. If you apply a force on that unconstrained joint, then you're not going to have pure rotation because it's not constrained. So you're going to have some translation. Now, if you look at a more constrained joint, you apply a similar force to that uh, joint, since it is more constrained, you're going to have less translation and more rotation. Now, if we look at the shoulder, so you have here a shoulder without any muscles and you put on the deltoid, if you have contraction of the deltoid, but we have no other muscles, what is going to happen is that you're going to have a vertical pull of the humeral head. And so you're going to have translation of the humerus because it is an unconstrained joint. Now, if we look at the hip and you have uh, the uh, uh, middle uh, gluteus muscle, it is a constrained joint. So when that muscle contracts, it's going to uh, contract against an opposing force that is uh, provided by the acetabulum. So you're going to have a fixed point. You're going to have the center of rotation. You're going to have a force couple. It's a constrained joint. So you have some rotation. Now, if you have the cuff, if you have the subscapularis, if you have the posterior cuff, if you have the supraspinatus, it's going to act as uh, an opposing force to that deltoid uh, traction is going to create a force couple, a vertical force couple. You're going to have a fixed point. The joint that is an unconstrained joint is going to be constrained by the muscles, dynamic, dynamically constrained, sorry. And so you're going to have some rotation. Okay. And so it's very important to understand that in the shoulder, we have a vertical force couple between 
the rotator cuff on the one hand and the deltoid on the other hand that creates uh, this movement of abduction and the horizontal force couple between the posterior cuff and the subscapularis that allows axial rotation, so internal and external rotation. Now, if we want to talk about moment arm, it's approximately the same thing as lever arm. If you are a pirate and you want to open that coffin, you can either use your hand, but it's very easy to understand that it's going to be difficult. And so you might want to use a crowbar. How does that work? If you take that weight here of 500 kilos, of course, you understand that the strength to lift that uh, um, weight of 500 kilos is going to be more if you have a very short uh, leverage, like on this uh, picture, or if you increase that leverage, uh, the force is going to be much less because there is a very simple formula. You have to divide the force that is necessary by the distance between the center of rotation and the line of action of the muscle, if you were talking about the shoulder, for example, or here, the line of action of the force that is applied on the, uh, the leverage here. So if we look at the shoulder, you have a center of rotation that is here. You have that line of action that is the, the line of action of the deltoid. And you have that distance D, which is the same distance as we've seen right here. And if, if we modify the shape of the shoulder, if we modify it to a reverse shoulder orthoplasty setting, we're going to modify the position of the center of rotation that is going to be here. And so that distance D is going to increase. And so the force necessary to obtain the same movement is going to be less important. Okay, so now we have some clear ideas. So it's important to have an idea also of the anatomy of the shoulder. So you know that it's an unconstrained joint and that 70% of the motion takes place in the glenohumeral joint and 30% in the scapulothoracic joint. We have 14 muscles that move the shoulder, but also they stabilize the shoulder, as you've seen. We have to, to transform that shoulder from an unconstrained joint to a dynamically constrained joint. So these muscles act as stabilizer of the shoulder. And so the muscles that are the most important, you have eight muscles for the glenohumeral joint. Among these eight muscles, you all know that you have the deltoid on the one hand and the rotator cuff on the other. And this creates a vertical force couple. And you also have an horizontal force couple between the posterior and anterior cuff and you have six muscles that move the scapulothoracic joint and among these muscles two are most important uh, the trapezius that is going to create upward rotation of the of the scapula and the serratus that stabilizes the scapula um, against the, the the thorax so now if we look at rotator cuff tears what happens when you have a rotator cuff tear, so we have again these force couples, and these force couples are going to be disrupted by the tear. And so sometimes you can have a very severe muscle imbalance, a vertical muscle imbalance. You can see here that the deltoid has been pulling the humeral head against the acromion. You don't have any more cuff probably in this patient, but yet she has great motion, great active motion, because she has a muscle imbalance, but she has a bony balance her joint has become like a hip. So now she has a fixed center of rotation thanks to the acromion that has become uh, acetabulized. And so uh, she has two opposing forces that allows her to have some abduction and uh, some uh, good range of motion. Now, sometimes we have mild muscle imbalance. In these patients, motion is possible. You can see she has no elevation lag sign. She can lift the arm. She has an intact teres minor. She has an intact subscapularis most of the time, but she has pain. So for these patients, many solutions have been proposed, but uh, one of the solutions could be a tendon transfer. This is not the, the discussion today. Um, again, here we can understand how muscle imbalance work. Uh, here you can have a complete horizontal muscle imbalance. You can see here that the posterior cuff is torn. This is what we see on the imaging. You have a nice subscapularis, no more posterior cuff. And so this patient, he has a nice balance in the uh, vertical plane. But when you ask uh, on the horizontal plane, he has an internal, uh, sorry, external rotation like sign. You place him in passive external rotation and he has no active external rotators. He has imbalance between the subscapularis and the posterior cuff. You can have the same thing exactly on the other side. Uh, when you have no more subscapularis and you can see that this patient, he has a deficit in internal rotation. He cannot put the arm in the back. He cannot lift off uh, the arm from the, from the, the buttocks uh, because he has no more subscapularis. 
Now, what happens when you have complete muscle vertical imbalance? So you have a deltoid, but you have no more cuff. We've seen that uh, in the beginning. You're going to have action of the deltoid that is going to push, to pull actually the, the humerus upwards. And so you're going to have upwards migration of the humerus instead of rotation. So you're going to have translation because you have no fixed point, no fixed center of rotation. And so uh, you're not going to have a, a good movement of rotation, of abduction or flexion. So you can see these patients. This is what we call pseudo paralysis. These patients, they have an elevation like sign. So you can see it's different from what we've seen previously. The lady before, we could place her arm uh, upwards. And when we let go of her arm, she could hold the position. But these patients, they cannot hold the position. They have a lag sign. And you can see very clearly the escape when they try to uh, lift the, the arm. You can see the, the superior escape and anterior superior escape of the of the um, of the humeral head they have complete rotations because they have no disruption of the of the horizontal plane but they have force couple sorry but they have disruption of the vertical uh, force couple and for these patients the only solution we know uh, to treat them in 2021 is uh, an invention from 1985 from paul gramont it is the reverse shoulder arthroplasty and so let's look at the reverse shoulder arthroplasty how does it work We've seen that a little bit before. The first point is the medialization of the center of rotation. So the center of rotation is brought from the center of the humeral head to the glenoid. By creating that, you augment, you increase the distance between the center of rotation and the line of action of the deltoid. And so you decrease the effort that is necessary for a similar movement from the deltoid. A second uh, effect of the reverse shoulder arthroplasty is the distalization of the humerus. As you can see here, the greater tuberosity is here. If you put it in a reverse setting, the greater tuberosity is much lower. The distance is greater from the acromion to the, to the greater tuberosity. And so you're going to have a distalization of the deltoid insertion, which is going to create a retensioning of the deltoid fibers, which is going to help the deltoid to function better. Of course, this distalization must be limited because if you increase that distance too much, the muscle fibers of the deltoid are not going to be functional anymore, and the nerves also might not be functional anymore. Then a very important effect of the reverse shoulder arthroplasty is that it transforms a non-constrained joint, that is the shoulder, into a semi-constrained joint. So we lose these translation forces that we can see in an anatomical setting, and all the forces that are applied on the humerus are converted automatically in a translation, in a, sorry, in a rotation movement. So this makes it much more effective. And finally, the last effect is that the center of rotation, instead of being here, as it was proposed in the first designs of reverse shoulder arthroplasty, has been uh, positioned in a very much medialized position at the interface between the glenoid implant and the bone. And this is going to create a decrease in the shear forces that apply on the glenoid, and it decreases the, glen the risk of glenoid loosening. Several biomechanical studies have been published uh, later after the invention of the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, showing that we can still lateralize a little bit that center of rotation, especially work from uh, uh, the team from Mark Frankel, showing that you can lateralize if your means of fixation are very strong, if you increase the diameter of the screws and uh, the fixation devices you use for, for the bone. But probably there is a limit to that glenoid lateralization and we cannot go that far because if we go too far, we're going to have some problems with the fixation of the glenoid implant. So this principle, these principles led to very good results, especially in elevation and abduction. But there was a price to pay with scapular notching between the um, the humerus and the scapular uh, pillar, which leads to osteolysis of the glenoid of the humerus to polyethylene wear to re resorption of the tuberosities. You can have poor improvement in external rotation, insufficient internal rotation, and sometimes instability by uh, an excessive slack in uh, the soft tissue and in the deltoid, and also a contour of the shoulder that is sometimes not very aesthetic and that uh, is not very pleasing for the patients. So these three uh, surgeons had the idea on their own um, to uh, modify the design of the shoulder arthroplasty to lateralize. But for a very long time, we've been talking, we've been talking of lateralization without analyzing this 
lateralization precisely. And we can see that you have three different methods of lateralizing, but they have different effects and, and they lead to different consequences. So first you can lateralize both in the glenoid, but also in the humerus. And for a very long time, people have been focusing on the glenoid, but we now know that the design of the humeral stem leads to uh, a greater lateralization actually that uh, uh, modifications in the design of the glenoid. And so if we look at how we can lateralize in the glenoid, we can modify the shape of the base plate and the, the sphere can be onlay instead of being inlay, which means that you have the thickness of the base plate that of lateralization. You can modify the shape of the sphere by being two thirds of a sphere instead of half of a sphere, or you can modify the shape of the scapular neck by adding bone, which lateralizes, of course, uh, the, the, the whole uh, implant. But you can also lateralize in the humerus, and you can do this by modifying the shape of the stem instead of being a very straight stem, as the first stems we've seen, uh, uh, the, the first delta implants. You can have now more curved stems. You can modify the neck shaft angle from 155 angle to 135 angle, and you can modify the position of the humeral insert which can either be inlay inside the metaphysis of the bone or onlay, it can be placed above the metaphysis of the bone. So you're going to lateralize by the thickness of that implant. And you can also modify the position, the connection of the stem and, uh, and the, the humeral onlay implant, which is going to modify the lateral offset. If we look at neck shaft angle, it is something that we've been discussing a lot recently. So modification of the neck, the neck shaft angle is interesting because it decreases scapular notching. If you modify that um, neck shaft angle, if you decrease that neck shaft angle, you're going to push away the humeral bearing from the scapular pillar. And so you're going to increase the impeachment free range of motion. And also another advantage is that if you have your humeral cut, if you cut at 155 degrees, then the exposure of the glenoid is going to be slightly more difficult than if you cut at 135 degrees because you're going to cut more bone. And so it's going to be uh, easier to push your humeral head posteriorly behind uh, the glenoid. Then inlay on lay, as we've been saying, if you, of course, modify the, the setting from an inlay implant to an onlay implant, you're going to increase the lateralization. And if you increase the thickness of that inlay of, the, of that onlay bearing, you're going to increase but that much uh, the lateralization of the humerus. And so it's very important to understand that lateralization leads to common biomechanical theoretical effects, whether you uh, lateralize in the glenoid or in the humerus. But this has different implications. So if we look at glenoid lateralization, this is going to push away the humerus from the scapular pillar, as you can see on this example here, you can see that the humerus is very far from the scapula. And so this is going to decrease scapular notching and to increase impingement free range of motion. But on the other hand, if you lateralize, if you push that center of rotation closer to the deltoid, you're going to decrease uh, the moment arm of the deltoid. You may increase acromial stress and you may increase shear forces on the fixation of the glenoid implant. So this lateralization, I think, is important, but, it, but it's limited. You cannot go too far lateral on the glenoid implant. Then the humor lateralization, well, this is important because I think it restores a more anatomical position of the humors and especially of the tuberosities. So it retentions the soft tissue and especially the cuff and the deltoid. By doing that, you increase the compressive forces on the joint. You improve stability. You increase the moment arm of the deltoid, of course, because you push away the deltoid light on action from the center of rotation and you increase the deltoid wrapping angle whether you believe in that or not. So if you combine glenoid lateralization and humor lateralization, it is something beneficial because you combine all those beneficial effects. But the risk is if you lateralize too much, especially in so smaller patients or patients with soft tissue contracture, you can lead to overstuffing and to poor motion, polyethylene wear, difficulty to reduce the joint, to stretching of the nerve, difficulty to repair the subscap, sometimes to impingement uh, with the acromion or even to acromion stress that can lead to acromion fractures. And so it is very important to understand that the reverse is the only way to restore uh, uh, forward elevation in case of vertical imbalance. Excessively medialized design have some disadvantages, so it is important to have some glenoid lateralization to reduce scapular notching and to improve 
uh, impingement free range of motion. It is important, I think, to decrease the neck shaft angle again to reduce that scapular notching and to improve that impingement free range of motion. Some amount of humor lateralization is probably necessary to restore a good anatomical position of the soft tissue and of the tuberosities. But it is important not to overstuff the joint and to adapt the implant and the technique to the patient's morphology and to, anato to the anatomy. So it's very important to know your implant and to modify the way you implant your shoulder arthroplasty depending on the remaining soft tissue, on the tightness of the shoulder, and on the uh, anatomy of the patient. And I think Philippe and Omar are going to discuss about this later on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jean-David. It's a very uh, a great pleasure to uh, to remain the basic concept because many many, many surgeons use uh, reverse prosthesis, but they doesn't know uh, the basic concept and uh, sometimes is a cause of instability or stiffness or failure of the prosthesis. And uh, many times we the surgeon says this is a bad prosthesis; it doesn't work. But I think that for each procedure, there is a, a planning to do. And it's a goal for this evening to show you what is the best planning for the, the reverse prosthesis. And uh, Omar will we, we'll do that very well. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with uh, you, Philippe, and Jean David. I uh, also need to thank uh, Shoulder Treaty for the great job to make this webinar easy for us and uh, also Efesh Orthopedics for uh, the good collaboration. Uh, and uh, if I may, thanks also all the attendees here uh, and hope you enjoy, enjoyed this webinar. I can start my uh, presentation here uh, about the 3D planification for reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Very interesting topic uh, tonight is the plan. Uh, as uh, you know, and John David said, improve, uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty improve functional outcome in patients suffering from cafeteria arthropathy and osteoarthritis. And the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, uh, um, it's technically challenging and exhibits many complications. Uh, in fact, proper component positioning is very important part uh, to achieving a good outcome. Uh, many studies, uh, clinical and biomechanical, have shown that the glenoid component positioning is important for clinical outcome in reverse. But pathologic glenoids with bone deformity and defects um, can make the situation difficult for the surgeon to identify anatomical landmarks and compromise accurate positioning of the implant. Uh, the conventional methods using the 3D CT scan and uh, the plane radiographs is a source of misrepresentation of a glenoid version and inclination compared to the 3D CT scan. So it's very important to have a 3D CT scan to prepare your uh, surgical plan. And the freehand reaming technique frequently used in an operating room without any planification results in deviation from the planned component placement. Uh, and we have a recent study from Julien Bewer shows the importance of the, this 3D reconstruction because the purpose of this study is to investigate glenoid component positioning in reverse for pathologic glenoids under two conditions with two groups. The first one is group visible 3D uh, surgery. Uh, and this is a group with uh, a 3D reconstruction and all view of the shoulder and second one is blind 3D surgeon. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a practical situation we have in the operating room and only the vision of the glenoid uh, and corrugate process. And the conclusion was very clear. The visible 3D surgery uh, can make the position and very accurate in reverse shoulder glenoid component. And the blind 3D surgery, this group, the surgeon were unable to position the reverse uh, component accurately, regardless of their experience. So our purpose here is to use a 3D planning software called an eOto as a technique for more accurately defined glenoid anatomy and transferring this desired preoperative plan to the surgical procedure for component placement. In our cases, without any specific uh, patient instrumentation, so no delay and no additional cost. Uh, keep in mind, uh, it's very important to have uh, the goals of component placement in reverse. For the glenoid base plate, 
you should have under 10 degree retroversion, neutral to inferior tilt about inclination, and you have to restore uh, quietly the native joint line by my accept medialization. Uh, and the second part, very important, as you have to achieve at least 50% base plate contact with the native glenoid bone. You can increase this contact with bone graft or augmented base plate. Uh, what about the software? Uh, it's eAuto software. You have to uh, create a new user account, uh, create a new patient. Uh, you have to fill a mandatory patient information and drag and drop the CT images you hold, you know, prepare, and the auto team uh, will review this CT image, doing the modeling reconstruction, uh, calling segmentation and long markings uh, to uh, do a reconstruction uh, in three dimension based on the upload CT images. And once the segmentation and long marks are ready, the status of your patient is ready for planning. So I will uh, go to, um, if I may show you the video of a practical uh, uh, presentation. And okay, here you are. Uh, you have your patient list and you have to uh, select your patient. Uh, we click into the arrow icon linked to them. And the software is composed from three pages. Uh, I make pause here just to show you. This is the first page is patient anatomy pages. Uh, allows you to understand the anatomy of your patient. You have the 2D CT scan uh, images on the left and uh, uh, on the right, you have the 3D reconstruction. You can switch between the images to understand uh, the anatomy of your patient and you can move your scapula all around. You can also with the uh, icon uh, just on the upper side to hide the humerus to uh, uh, have a look to the erosion of your glenoid. And at the bottom, you have uh, the patient anatomy bar with the native version, in this case, 10 degree retroversion, inclination, the native one is eight degrees superior inclination and the posterior subluxation. Uh, once you have understand the anatomy of your patient, the native uh, orientation of his uh, glenoid, you can move to the second page of our planification. Uh, just here with the, the arrow icon is uh, the glenoid plane page. Uh, this one allows you to prepare your planification. Uh, you have many uh, tools here and you can set the implant, choose anatomic one, reverse one, uh, you can set the position uh, and just here you can also have the key option if you uh, want to use long peg or standard one. Um, I will show you just here, you can choose 44 just here, the key options I can switch to the long peg, but in this situation I uh, don't need it. Uh, and for my patient, I will uh, make a choice for 44 small. Uh, you can also hide the glenosphere to have a better view of your metal back. Uh, I will show you just in a couple of seconds, like here. And in this position, now you can set your uh, implant and you choose uh, the version and the inclination. Uh, as you see, we have a range of plus 10 degrees because it's according to the drying guide we can use in the operating room. Uh, and uh, uh, be aware, uh, very important uh, to have this information on the head. Uh, the version and the inclination, it's two interactive parameter. If you change your version, you automatically change your inclination. This is a 3D uh, vision. It's very important to keep in mind this. And when I choose just here, a plus 10 degrees inferior inclination with the, this draining guide, my implant is five degree inferior inclination and the native was eight. And uh, here the implant is five degree retroversion. When I use plus 10, degrees guide of retroversion uh, and switch my native uh, position uh, of the uh, glenoid from 10 to 5. I can also have better information about the position of my uh, metal back in anterior posterior and uh, superior inferior plan 
and switch to this 2D CT scan. And uh, as we see, just have so close to the, my posterior cortical and I have to move it anteriorly to be flush to the anterior board and the position of the kale is better for me. And I switch also for the coronal view just here to set the coronal position and I, I'm quite flush to the inferior board of the glenoid and I can improve my bone contact with increased rimming in the center part and my sitting is 71%. Uh, I go to the, my 3D reconstruction. I have this option is very interesting, the scapular transparency uh, to see uh, through the, the, the bone, uh, your uh, position of the kill. And also you will see we have a small gap in the superior and posterior part because we have to adjust the retroversion and inclination. At this step, I can see that my planification is already on the way because we have my implant in five degree retroversion, five degree inferior inclination, and the bone sitting is 71%. This for me is very satisfying and I can move to the next page of my planification this is a screw page uh, planification. I will show you in a few moments. So all the options is good for me. I can move to my screw planning. And this is screw planning page enables you to uh, choose the position, the direction and the length of the screws, upper one and uh, lower one. Uh, the eAuto software uh, can recommend it by default uh, the length and the position, but you have a choice and uh, the software could display some warning, uh, but you don't care because you have uh, the choice to make about the length and the position. Uh, I will show you the, the screw I uh, choose for my patient. I will move my inferior screw to from 36 to 40 and the direction seems to be more satisfied for me. Upper one in 25. I have all contact through the bone in the upper side and lower side. And also you can use the 2D CT images on the left to say to, to, to have a, a better view of the position of the upper and the lower screw. I will show you just here you have a, a global view of your planification position of screw and just here we can see that my lower screw is on the on the bone through rule, no problem here and we don't have any uh, just here in the upper one good position and in the axial view you can see the screw is in good position and the upper one also. My planification is done. I'm satisfied. I can, at this point, validate my surgical planning and your software will generate automatically a PDF report. It's very practice because this PDF report can be used in your operating room and you have all the information about your planification. Just here you have the driving guide you should use to uh, transfer in your planification uh, on your surgery uh, and uh, also all the length of the screw, all the options here with the size of uh, the glenosphere, the metal back and also uh, the deep uh, of the rimming. Uh, that's it. My planification is done. It's very important to uh, have two words about reliability uh, because it's very important to do a, a good planification, but how can uh, this planification be reliable and reproducible? Uh, you have just one uh, interesting uh, studies here recent uh, 
uh, study uh, from uh, the team of friends. Um, but this team using a patient specific instrumentation and using a scanographic uh, post op scan uh, to um, uh, have a verification uh, between the planification and the position of the implant. And the main difference between the planned measures and the post op was inferior to uh, 2.5, very interesting, and the screw length corresponded with the pre op plan in uh, 70 of the cases. Uh, in our team, I have also uh, with Philip do some uh, CT scan in post op to check the position of the implant. I, uh, if I may share with you two uh, of my cases. This is the first one. It's a patient with a reverse shoulder atroplasty. Uh, the version uh, chosen was zero uh, to put the implant in zero version and three degree inferior inclination. Uh, when using a drying guide with 10 degrees inclination. And uh, in the post op, you have to see in the right side uh, that the inclination is uh, quite close. Uh, and uh, the inclination, three degree in fear, I uh, put it in 1.3 uh, degree. The second one, very interesting also because these patients have a native in superior inclination 13, and uh, I switch it to 7. Uh, inferiorly with using a drill guide with 20 degrees uh, inclination and uh, you can see this inclination in 6.0 uh, 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 in post-op scan and the version uh, planned was 9 retroversion and we are quite close to the 8. Uh, so um, it seems to be uh, quietly reproducible and uh, very interesting at this time, but you need to go further with uh, our cases uh, and more scan and more analysis. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I have to uh, send a message. 3D planification actually for reverse is mandatory to optimize your, your implant position and hope a better clinical outcome. But as I say, uh, should be reproducible in operator room uh, using specific guide, our technique or uh, augmented uh, reality maybe, but more study is needed for reliability for each of these procedures. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Omar. I will present the last presentation. We, we try to answer to your question on the chat. We will try to answer immediately. So my presentation is a, a practical case of uh, curved hair arthropathy and uh, I did the reverse arthroplasty and I would like to give you some tips and tricks with surgery. Uh, I use the e-ortho software, of course, the preoperative planning with uh, the PDF, very useful because uh, as described by Omar, you can take the PDF in your operating room and you can follow your preoperative planning. This is my uh, disclosure. This is a woman, 85 years old. She is very painful, you see, because the visual analog scale is 8 per 10. The function is limited and is 50% with a constant score 27. You see that the range of motion is 80 degree of forward elevation she is limited in external rotation, but she has extern active external rotation in position one or two. Or the internal rotation is so limited. So when you see this kind of patients with a, a curved tear arthropathy, you try to do physiotherapy, you try to do in injection. But after three years, uh, I saw the patient with a, a failure of conservative treatment. This is a video. You see that? Okay. De la main 80 degrees, sur la bouche. not too much. Okay. She has no ordonnance sign. She has active external rotation, okay. but it's, it's very, gros. very painful. She has a no lag sign. She has an active external rotation. This is the X-rays. It's very important to see that uh, on these X-rays, you have a medialization. You have a medialization of the joint. The position is not up where you see that there is a cuff in continuity and there is a little posterior subluxation. And uh, you do MRI, you do CT scan, 
And you see that on the MRI, the, there is a fatty infiltration on the atrophy of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, on the superior part of the subscapularis. So deltoid is very important to evaluate. There is a weak deltoid and it's not very strong. And uh, if you decide to do a reverse prothesis in this situation, I think that is important to, to understand that the, the goal is to distalize your prothesis because there is not a functional cuff, there is a weak deltoid, and we know that if you want to obtain a good deltoid, you have to distalize on a little lateralization. On a, I, we adapt the positioning of the prosthesis depends of soft tissue. And in this situation, the goal was distalization because no calf, no functional calf, and weak deltoid, on lateralization to retention the remaining teres minor on subscapularis. So I use uh, I use a software here too on the. You can choose uh, the best prosthesis. You can choose the best positioning, and uh, you do a PDF. And you see that for this patient, the native version was five degrees of retroversion. The inclination was uh, eight degree, one one degree of superior inclination. And you remember that the academic roles of the reverse prosthesis is no antiversion on vertical or better a little inferior tilt. And you have to respect these rules if you want to avoid glenoid loosening, it's very important. And we have a guide and with the software we decided to do to use a guide without posterior compensation version zero on inclination with 10 degrees. If you do 10 degrees of, of inclination, you can obtain a degree of inferior tilt on the retroversion of five degrees and is very ac acceptable. You use a metal back, a base plate, standard base plate, small one because we prefer to use a small one a, a base plate in this situation because the deformity is less to compensate if you use a, a, a small that a bigger one base plate. 36 because this is a woman and you see that we define the contact is 48%, around 50% is, is correct because you know that you remember the design of the prosthesis, there is a central keel, there is an anterior windlet and there is a primary good press fit fixation. And you know that the distance between the center of the prosthesis and the anterior wall is 17 millimeters, and the distance between the center of the prosthesis and the inferior part is 15 millimeters. You can measure the screw, 36, 36. You rim a little because you see that there is a medialization. You know that if you want to retention the remaining cuff, you do you have to do a little. Uh, lateralization. It's the reason why we don't go too majorly in this situation. So I show you this uh, perioperative situation. This is here. You have uh, in delta pectoral approach, you have to remove all the capsule, you have to remove all the soft tissue to define the inferior point of the glenoid, the superior point of the glenoid on the coracoid process. And you have to define the axis of your prosthesis. It's very important. If you do a little mistake of 10 degrees, it's a big mistake because you modify version on inclination. You see that uh, you put a posterior inferior retractors and you use the guide. You see that you remember that the distance, 17 millimeters, 15 millimeters, you use your guide with 10 degrees of inclination on neutral version. And you put, it's very important this point because after you follow your Kishner wire, 
you put your Kishna wire, and after you check, you measure the distance to be sure that you are in a good position. I think it's very, very important if you want to reproduce your preoperative planning. You ruin the cartilage, very important to remove any cartilage to avoid micro motion on the base plate, and you remove the, with the curette, and you have to be very, very safe with, uh, with the curette, and you prepare the keel with a special instrument, and after you prepare the keel, and after you use a punch to uh, to follow the, the Kishna wire. You see that it's very important the positioning of the Kishna wire because after the, the operation is finished. You see, you have a superior space where you move anteriorly to put the anterior windlet, and you have a superior space that you have to to push uh, to put a cancerous bone graft. You increase the potential grow with uh, some uh, holes and you put the cancerous bone graft here back to the base plate and uh, we did a CT scan and we were we are very happy regarding the, the potential inning of 100% of this. Uh, you see that you have an impaction and you have a primary fixation of the prothesis. If you have not a primary fixation with a standard, you remove the standard and you put a long peg immediately because the screw is a very effective, but uh, it's not very, the most important is the primary press fit of the base plate. With the screw, we perforate the cortical bone and you obtain a good compression, a good compression of the graft, a good compression of the base plate. You see that you put a, a little inferior tilt. Okay. And after you put a glenosphere. 36. You impact the glenosphere of 36. And after you try to reduce. Okay. So this is a post-operative uh, X-rays. We do uh, now a systematically CT scan after six months, and we compare with the preoperative planning. And as described with Omar, we have around uh, two to five degrees of uh, of variation. And uh, but the most important is not a superior tilt. You see that you have a bone graft here. You have a inferior tilt, you see that the line of the supraspinatus, and you have a little lateralization because uh, the great tuberosity is lateral to the acromion. So my conclusion is, uh, is a very important point, that before to do a, a reverse prothesis now, systematically, we do standard X-rays on CT scan. And CT scan is very important to evaluate the status of the calf, fatty infiltration, atrophy, and the fatty infiltration of the deltoid. Because we adapt the positioning of our prothesis to the soft tissue. And you know that with e -ortho, based on the CT scan, you can measure, and this is a manual uh, calculation, and you can measure the inclination, the native version, and the medialization of the glenoid. Is that in the future? But in the future, you can measure. You will measure the lateralization of the humerus in a few months. But now, it's sure that you can evaluate inclination and version. And with the X-ray, I evaluate the medialization. With eortho, we choose the best implant, standard, long peg, the size of the glenoid. The size of the glenosphere depends on the size of the head. And with the guide, you can reproduce a good positioning of your implant. And the recommendation of the group is uh, an inferior tilt between 0 to 10 degrees and a retroversion between 0 to 10 or to 8 degrees. No anteversion, please. And we can, 
lateralization we cannot measure today, but in the future we will measure the lateralization. With Jean David and uh, with uh, Omar, we decided to to explain you that what is the position of the posi of the prothesis today is not science scientific basis, but we have the experience of the patients. And now, we, when you have no posterior superior cuff and a weak deltoid, we try to reproduce a delta prothesis. More distalization and a little lateralization for remaining cuff. If you have a strong deltoid, if you have a cuff deficiency, you can lateralize. It's a, a recommendation, not, not distalize. It's not necessary. Lateralization is more important to evaluate to, uh, to, 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 for the deltoid, for a good deltoid. The problem is a patient of 80 years old, and I would like to discuss with you uh, regarding the indication today, because many patients are around 80 years old has a good calf, a functional calf, osteoarthritis, and many surgeons use uh, anatomic arthroplasty, but uh, we think that 80 years old, the natural history of the cuff is a progressive degenerative cuff, progressive rupture of the supra and infraspinatus, and the risk of revision of the prothesis after five or 10 years. And some patients now, uh, 85 or 90 years old, they are very active and uh, they don't accept a revision. And if they are painful, I, we prefer to avoid this revision, even there is a functional cuff, to try to reproduce the anatomy. We reproduce the lateral offset, and we distalize a little, but not too much, but we repair the cuff, we keep the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and we repair anatomically the, uh, the subscapularis. And we have an experience now of more than 50 cases with a very, very good result very happy on the very fast recovery on any revision after five years. It's the reason that for 80 years old now, uh, we, we do, even the cuff is functional, we do a uh, reverse autoplasty. But I, I think that this point is important because we, uh, we progress in this, uh, in this way. We have no scientific data to prove that, uh, but many, maybe in a few months, uh, we do publication of that to prove that with a three, four, five years, we have no complication with reverse, even you have a good uh, cuff. And very interesting, I did CT scan after one year, and the, the cuff continues to work, uh, even you do a CT scan, and it's a very important point that. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe now, uh, maybe if you have uh, some comments, uh, Jean-David, because uh, we have five minutes, we have just on time, and Omar, maybe... Uh, I to... think uh, we have another two questions uh, to submit uh, to our attendees uh, in order to have, uh, in polls, to have uh, the opinion uh, about uh, using PSI and navigation. Yes. Uh, Philippe, I have a, a question about the, this uh, uh, elderly patient with a functional cuff. Um, I have the same uh, attitude if, uh, about this, but uh, what, what do you do about the supraspinatus if uh, in your operator your when you operate your patient you have a good supraspinatus good insertion you keep it uh, and you put your uh, reverse uh, shoulder atroplasty or uh, we remove it and uh, you go away with your uh, sh 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 surgery uh, like you have usually done no, always keep it always keep it okay and I, I, I close the rotator interval laterally. Okay. As anatomical no, implant. No difference with an anatomical implant. No. I think it's interesting. I the totally agree. It's very important. The result of the polls because 57% uh, uh, of, the, of the attendees uh, practice uh, a CT scan. And, uh, 
I am surprised that they don't do any systematically because 43 percent only in difficult cases. Yes. Maybe the reason is um, economic. Maybe economic in uh, in countries because uh, it's very expensive a CT scan in some countries. Yes, we would like to thank everyone for the question. We try with uh, with Omar to. Uh, and um, Gide to answer to your question for the ch during the chat. Maybe uh, I think that if you have more questions, you can put on the shoulder free tea and uh, we will answer you uh, as soon as possible. Thank you, FH Orthopedics, to, to give the opportunity uh, to do this, uh, this webinar. And I think that uh, uh, we we push you to to use the e ortho because we think that for the patient is a very very a big advantage because you you can explain to the patient that you could you choose the custom made implant for the patient you do preoperative planification and the patient is very happy to know that you work uh, for the best for him and I think that I I uh, I push you to use that. And you understand better the the deformity of the glenoid. You understand better your mistake. And uh, of course, uh, this is one step. And uh, the future step is uh, is more may, maybe uh, a, a new techniques, uh, digital techniques. And I think that in few years, we use systematically for all the patients. Thank you for your. Uh, attention and uh, don't hesitate to to send a question on email thank you everyone thank you philippe thank you all thank you fh thank you Ellen. Have, have a nice evening